Hello, my name is Brad Kramer with Provenio Consulting. Today I'd like to talk about a topic that a lot of manufacturers or different uh, employers struggle with, which is lockout and tagout. Um, probably the some of the biggest reasons that, that companies struggle with lockout and tagout is there is a lot of confusion with what the standard means. So I'm going to cover a couple topics that have to do with lockout tagout um, to, to make some clarifications on devices such as locks and tags, the difference between lockout and tagout, um, and what is a good disconnect source? What should you be putting a lockout um, device on versus what you should not be locking out on? So um, covering these topics, I'm going to share my screen here. All right, the, the first thing we're going to talk about here is the difference between lockout and tagout. Lockout and tagout are two totally different uh, methods or means of securing a machine against unauthorized startup. So when we talk about, uh, you know, somebody's locking out a piece of equipment and they're working on that machine, they want to make sure that somebody's not going to walk by and be able to turn that power on and energize that equipment, either causing it to um, move so they'd get caught in the machine one way or another, or for energy such as electricity, um, to pose a, a risk such as electrocution or any other type of uh, energy. So when we talk about um, lockout and tagout, two totally different things, when we're locking out a, a device, if you can see my lock here, it has um, the signage on it that's required. It says danger locked out, do not remove. And on the back here, there's a place where we can put the name of the employee that's working with this lock. All right, if we have a lock like this that has um, labeling on it and that employee's name is on that lock, um, we're gonna be doing what's called lockout. All right, OSHA says you have to lock out equipment unless there's some reason you can't lock it out, in which case you can use tag out. Um, so in the 20 years or so that I've been in industry, I've never seen one single um, company that I've worked for use tag out in place of lockout. Um, so having seen hundreds, if not thousands of lockout procedures. Um, I've never seen tag out use. It's very rare that, that companies actually lock out and tag out um, using a combination of, for example, tag out on some energy sources and lock out on others. Um, so most companies are using exclusively lockout. So you're using lockout procedures versus tag out. All right, we're not locking and tagging out one piece of equipment, just because we have a tag like this doesn't mean we're tagging it out, okay? So what does that mean in application for you as a company? A lot of times, one of the biggest gripes that employees or other workers have about um, handling lockout equipment is if you give them a lock and you're putting this tag on, on the lock, and let's say they, oops, excuse me, let's say they have three or four different locks um, so they're keeping their locks on their belt or somewhere else. Um, this is a lot of stuff to, to lug around. It's, it's not necessarily that big, but this tag is going to be um, catching on things, getting caught on their belt or wherever they're, um, like if they're putting on a keychain on their belt or in their toolbox. Um, it really adds a lot of, uh, a lot of inconvenience to the lockout um, device. So as long as you have the, the signage and the person's name on your lock, you are not required um, for any reason to have this type of tag on your locks. Now, some companies will use um, the tag um, specifically for, maybe they'll issue everybody a tag and the employee's names will be on the tag and they have generic locks. So they might have the signage on the lock, but rather than assigning a lock to everybody, the employees just grab a, a um, random lock off a wall or off a, you know, a, a lockout display, put their personalized tag on it and then this is their, their tag or their lockout device. All right, so there's nothing wrong necessarily with having a lock with the tag on it. However, it just adds more inconvenience to the employees sometimes. All right, but um, lockout and tag out, two totally different things. Just because we have this tag on this lock, we're not using lockout tag out. We're not locking and tagging equipment out. We're just locking the equipment out. Um, tag out, just the tag alone, if we're only using this, we're going to be putting this on an energy source. And this isn't securing that lock. This is communicating to any employee or any worker that's walking past it, that sees it, hey, do not turn this energy source on. Um, 
any machine that's been retrofitted or renovated um, since 1990 is required to have um, been uh, fitted with a lockout device so that they can so that somebody can put a lockout device on it rather than using tag out. So there, there's very few places where you're actually going to use just a tag and use tag out. So a lockout tag out, two totally different means to ensuring a machine can't start up again. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about here is what constitute a lockout device? So when we look at a lock like this, there's, there's several elements to it that are required by OSHA um, and that differentiate it between a lock, uh, a lockout device or a lockout lock and a placeholder lock. So first we'll talk about what is a lockout lock. Uh, first of all, it can only have a single key, right? We don't wanna be saving any master key for our lockout locks, right? You order a lock and it comes with two keys, like this one here came with two keys. Um, the first thing you want to do, take that key, take it off the ring and chuck it in the garbage. Um, the only reason I keep two keys here is for demonstration purposes only. This lock will never be used to lock out a device. It's just used for training. So I have two keys on it for that very reason, um, demonstrating that if it comes with two keys, throw that thing in the garbage. We don't wanna have two keys around our facility for any lockout lock. Um, second, the key has to stay in the worker's control. So if I'm the employee putting my lock on a device, I put the lock on the device, take the key. This key should go in my pocket on a keychain on my belt, um, somewhere like that where I'm gonna maintain control of this key. It shouldn't go um, sitting on my toolbox. It shouldn't be sitting on a work surface um, nearby the machine. This needs to stay in my control so nobody else can take this key and start that equipment up again. Um, the key owner needs to be identified on the lock. So like on this side here where it says property of, um, that employee should have their name on this lock. These stickers are very easy to replace. So if you purchase your equipment through Granger or Fastenal or whoever, um, you should be able to go online and, and simply order uh, new stickers. So if you have turnover in employees or if the sticker gets too worn, um, you can just slap another sticker right on it, write their name on it, and you're good to go again. Um, one thing that I've found with lockout locks is your, your basic just ballpoint pen. So like if you can see this, this is just a, uh, a paper mate. Um, these are the best pens that I've found for writing workers' names on the lock where it's not going to smudge off. Um, Sharpies, uh, specialized pens that use like uh, felt tips or anything else like that, or even your fancier ballpoint pens typically do not work on this and the ink wipes right off. So for example, Sharpies, um, when I've tried those, you just write on and 10 minutes later, it'll still usually wipe right off. So cheap ballpoint pen is the best way usually for getting a worker's name on a lock like this. So it should have their name on it. And it should have verbiage similar to danger locked out. So communicating to other workers that they should not ever be removing this lock. Um, locks need to have one of the below um, consistencies among them. So color, shape, or style, and size, right? We don't wanna have, say half the locks in our facility be say a style like this. And we don't wanna, and having a totally different style of lock um, for maybe half the other locks in the facility, they should all be consistent. Now we can have the same style of locks and have different colors. Um, so for example, you might have operators have a red lock, maintenance might have a purple lock, quality control might have a blue lock, for example. So you can have different colors denoting maybe different departments um, or different, uh, um, different responsibilities within the company, something like that, but they need to be consistent in either style, color, or um, size. Needs to be durable and substantial. So this is a durable lock, right? Of course, I can, I can break it if I hit it repeatedly with a hammer or use a bolt cutter on it, um, but it's not a lock that's gonna be simple to Jimmy, such as, for example, if, if uh, when we think about luggage, when you buy a new, uh, a new suitcase, they come with the, the pretty small flimsy locks um, somebody can take a screwdriver and just pop that right off. It's not durable or substantial enough. So you want substantial equipment um, that you're going to be um, issuing for your lockout devices. 
should be used exclusively for locking equipment out. Um, employees should never be using their lockout device for locking their locker, um, their tools, anything else like this. The only thing this should be used for is locking out machinery. And finally, the only person that should ever be removing this lock is the worker that applied it, unless your company has and follows a procedure that, that matches up with OSHA's requirements for removing a lock. Um, so that's going to typically require that you're trying to contact that employee and documenting it. Um, the person who did cut it off and the rationale. And you need to contact that employee before, when they come back to work, before they go out on the shop floor, they need to sign off acknowledging that they acknowledge that their lock was cut off. It's not them admitting wrongdoing. It's not a disciplinary procedure. It's simply them signing off that I understand that my lock is no longer on this machine that I applied it to before they go out on the shop floor. Now, when we look at placeholder locks, such as the green American lock on the, on the right side of the screen here, placeholder locks are commonly used in facilities where uh, maybe maintenance or supervisors have to oversee a lockout procedure, um, even though they may not be working on that equipment, for example. Um, a lot of times in food manufacturing, it'll be applied by quality control. So somebody in quality puts their placeholder lock on a lockout device um, so that that equipment cannot be operated until quality control releases it um, from, uh, say, say they've uh, inspected it, swabbed it, made sure it was sanitary and stuff like that. Um, placeholder locks are not designed to lock out a machine, um, but rather keep it out of service. Um, so a, a placeholder lock may have multiple keys. For example, everybody in the facility who's a supervisor uh, might have key for placeholder locks for supervisors. Not all facilities use placeholder locks, but many do, and they're very useful. Um, they, so they can have multiple keys. Um, labels or IDs aren't required on them, so they don't have to have the same signage um, such as a lockout lock has to have. They can be completely bare. Um, it's not a lockout lock. So let's say I'm a, I'm a supervisor and I supervise a, a, a lockout procedure. So I'm making sure that everybody verified the energization correctly. Um, everybody bled the energy correctly. All the locks are on correctly. So uh, maybe I put my lock on, um, noting that I authorize that process. Now, if I'm going to be actually working on that machine, I still have to put my lockout device on that machine in addition to a placeholder lock. So a placeholder lock is not my lockout device. All right, so some substantial differences between a placeholder lock and a lockout lock, two totally different functions. Um, neither one of them do the job of the other. All right, the next thing talking about out of service. So let's say maintenance is working on a piece of equipment and you're going to be waiting a week for parts for that machine. Nobody's working on that machine. It's just out of service for the next week or until whenever parts come for it. We don't want to be using lockout locks to put that machine out of service if nobody's working on it. Um, OSHA specifically talks about this in a letter of interpretation. Um, the reason being is that when we see signage as workers in a facility, if that signage for safety items is not used correctly, we get used to seeing it and it loses its meaning. So when you think about a wet floor sign, um, let's say somebody mops up a spill and, or let's say they do their daily cleaning and they're mopping up and they put a wet floor sign out and that wet floor sign stays out in perpetuity, right? Employees walk by it and they get used to seeing wet floor. It loses its meaning. It no longer tells us that floor is wet. Um, so what happens is people get used to seeing it, it loses its meaning, and somebody trips or slips and falls um, because they weren't um, respecting the flat fact that the floor was wet because that sign lost its meaning. So OSHA does not want to see anybody using lockout locks to secure a piece of equipment long term. Um, that should be a totally different type of lock, such as a placeholder lock or a tag that says out of service, but it should not say locked out anywhere on it. Um, a talking about this, there, there is a uh, exemption to that that would be if employees are working, the same employees working on the same equipment day after day. Um, so let's say you have a crew of three employees that are working on a, a piece of equipment and they're going to be working on that equipment all week long, the same team of employees, the same equipment. 
when they go home, they can leave their lock on it, assuming they're going to come back the next day and go back to work on that equipment. Um, and OSHA also talks about this in a letter of interpretation. The reason being is that um, every time a worker applies their lock to a machine, they should be checking everything out. They should be checking and making sure that it's um, de-energized and that the, the locks are, and locking devices are applied correctly and making sure that the equipment is bled correctly. So if they're keeping their lock on, say those three days in a row, they don't have to do that same inspection day after day or every time they come into work. The exception to that is if there's any potential for any energy source to bleed into that machine. So let's say if a, a leak, um, there's potentially just a small leak in a valve. Um, if there's even the potential, not that there is a leak, but there's a potential that say steam energy or compressed air, something else could bleed into that machine, um, making sure that somebody is checking and making sure that that machine is bled periodically to ensure there is no um, buildup of energy. Um, so that would be the, the exception. If there's a, a potential that um, energy leaked into that equipment, say overnight, um, while, the, while the locks are still attached, it should still be inspected um, and anything bled out before it goes back in service. But this is not an out of service lock. All right, the next thing talking about, what's a good lockout point? Where are we gonna put this lock? Um, we don't wanna use um, say e-stop or emergency stop buttons or stop and start buttons as our lock source. So when we look at the picture here, um, for example, if we look at the e-stop, I have seen companies that um, they put on like a cover over the top of that e-stop and secure that cover shut. So somebody will push the e-stop, put the cover over it and apply their lock. And that is not a good disconnect source. The reason is, is that e-stops typically don't de-energize a piece of equipment. They only immobilize certain functions on it. So for example, if we're talking about a, a CNC machine, for example, if we hit the stop button on a CNC machine, the hydraulics are still running, there's still electricity to the machine. It's only disabled the server servos so that, um, so that the table and the, the tooling can't move. All right, we still have energy to it. We still have things pressurized. So we don't want to rely on the e-stop. We want to go straight to the electrical disconnect or any other energy sources to it. Don't go to the e-stop because the machine can still operate and have energy. Very similar to stop and start buttons like we see at the top of the picture here. Um, so sometimes companies will do kind of the same thing. A cover goes over that, that stop and start button um, so somebody can't push it. Those buttons can fail um, which can lead to that machine starting up. Um, sometimes there'll be a solenoid that that switch um, just runs a low voltage source that goes to a solenoid. Um, that solenoid can fail, um, causing that machine to start up. Um, the other thing is there's like, just like with the e-stop, there's still gonna be electricity going to the machine. There's an energy, not just electricity, could be any type of energy source at the machine. That start button isn't disabling that it's simply um, preventing a process from starting. So we wanna be using an actual disconnect, something that's gonna disable the energy going to that machine. It's gonna disconnect. There's gonna be a break in there, whether it's an open switch um, or like an airline, you know, taken apart or disconnected one way or another, we wanna disconnect the energy, not just um, disable it through an e-stop. So make sure you're using a proper um, disconnect. All right, so that's all I have for lockout tagout. We covered the difference between lockout and tagout. We covered what is a lockout device, what makes it a lock compared to say a placeholder. And we talked about what makes a proper disconnect or um, a lockout point. If you have any other questions on lockout tagout, I would be happy to answer anything for you. Um, just email me, brad at proveniaconsulting.com. Um, I may not be able to answer every question based on, you know, what type of machinery you have or anything else like that, um, because I may not have all the facts in front of me, but I'll see if I can help you out and keep your workplace safer. Brad Kramer from Provenio Consulting, and have a great day.